You good? Okay. Take heart. Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome this morning to our 10 a.m. service. It's been a big morning so far with lots of things happening, especially the weather. I'm glad that a number of you have braved the morning, uh, been able to come out. I believe that uh, uh, it's going to be harder for others because uh, things like rivers and other things have risen um, and floods have come about. And so we've had a few things that have happened. Uh, I hope that a few of our people who are not here today will be at home watching us on, uh, online. And good morning to those who are there too. Today we are uh, continuing on in our sermon series. In fact, this really brings us to the end. I've tacked one on. Uh, last week was meant to be the last, the last week of our sermon series, uh, but I've tacked one on in, uh, in the religions of Marylands and uh, how to talk with people in a destructive cult. Now, we, did, uh, we looked at destructive cults and how they work a few weeks back, and I thought, well, there was so much involved with it, it would be good to actually follow it up with how might you talk with someone who's in one. And so that's what uh, we're doing today. It's quite a big talk, um, and so it's longer than a normal one. Uh, but we'll be going through that a little later on. Uh, right now we're going to have a look at some church news. Um, you'll see that there's a Holiday Kids Club coming up this week. Uh, Clive, did you want to say anything? Hi everyone, uh, it's very exciting, we're having our Holiday Kids Club this Friday, yay, give me a yay, uh, we've got 43 kids registered which is fantastic, uh, 24 of those kids are not from our church which is really wonderful, uh, and we're having our family uh, games hour from 2 to 3 on the, on the Friday afternoon, so even if you can't come for the whole day, if you can just come for that hour or even afternoon tea to try and meet people and welcome them uh, who are not part of our church. It would be wonderful if you could be there, even for half an hour, from 3 o'clock to 3.30. And please be praying for it, that it will be a loving um, atmosphere, and people will feel really welcome and come to know the love of Jesus, uh, and the gospel will be preached well. Thanks so much, guys. Looking forward to it. See you. Hi everyone. Um, yeah, there we are. Great. Um, I am excited uh, this morning to announce that um, my sister Alex and I are starting a church book club um, and we would love to have you join us. Um, let me pull up my notes. So um, Alex and I have both found that Christian books have been a really um, important part of our um, growth in our faith um, and we're excited at the idea of um, reading a book alongside a bunch of other people from church um, and being able to really discuss it and reflect on it and apply it together. Um, so uh, the details of how we're going to do this exactly haven't all been ironed out. It might depend on um, how many people we have and, and who's keen. But um, the basic idea is to have a book that we read each term. And so we'll read the book over the course of the term. And then at the end in the school holidays, we'll meet up um, and have a good night of uh, reflection and prayer about the book together. Um, but we'd also like to have some way throughout the term that we can be discussing chapters as we go. So it might be a Facebook group, it might be um, occasional Zoom calls. Um, we haven't quite ironed all that out, but we're keen to hear what, what people would like to do. Um, the book that we're going to be starting with is up on the screen. It's called um, Enjoying God by Tim Chester. I read this several years ago and, and I found it really helpful. I think we talk a lot about our relationship with God, um, but we maybe don't always know what that actually looks like in our everyday. So in this book, um, Tim Chester helps us to know what it is to enjoy God as he's revealed himself to us as Father, Son and Spirit. So how we can enjoy relating to God as our Father, um, to Jesus and to the Holy Spirit. Um, and it's very practical. It shows um, what it looks like in our everyday life. There's sort of a running um, story about a couple just going through their normal day and what it looks like for them to enjoy God in that. Um, so we're really excited about reading this book. Um, the cost of the book is usually $20. Um, first few people who get in, um, I bought a few on sale for $14. So if you want it cheap, um, sign up fast and I'll give you a copy. Um, 
I've put my email address and phone number up there. Um, it would be great. We want to start at the beginning of term, so let us know. You can talk to me. You can talk to Alex. Um, we're actually going on holiday and won't be at church next week, maybe not the week after. So I've put my um, phone number and email up there. You can also Facebook message me. Um, just let me know that you'd like to join us, and we hope to see a whole lot of you uh, to enjoy God together. Thank you. Thank you, Cassie. Um, there's only one more thing to uh, look at, and uh, apparent now when is this India Day? Today. Today. Uh, shall we have a look at the video? And if you want to say anything further. Okay. So we'll. Okay, so I'm going to ask Clive to come up and he can speak to... He, he was on a video, so now he can be live. <laughs> live, Clive. Welcome to Live Clive. <laughs> now, um, so Indian Christian Day is a thing that uh, in, uh, Christians in India started last year uh, to celebrate the gospel going to India almost 2,000 years ago. You probably didn't realize, but the gospel went to India before it went to Europe. Around 52 AD, the Apostle Thomas is said to have gone to uh, Kerala and was supposed to be martyred in Chennai in 72 AD. And so recently the, the BJP government has been very extreme, saying that uh, India is a Hindu nation and all other religions, all other cultures are foreign kind of invaders trying to destroy Indian culture. But that's simply not true. The gospel has been in there for almost 2,000 years and has been a great blessing to Indian society, uh, helping them to preserve their language, their culture, uh, and being a real blessing in, in education and health and all kinds of things. Uh, I've got an article on Eternity News if you want to look that up to get some more information. Uh, but we're trying to raise awareness and get people praying uh, every year on the 3rd of July, which is supposed to be the day that uh, St. Thomas was martyred in, uh, in Chennai. Uh, so please, would you join with me in prayer? And I'd love to chat to you more about it um, after the service. Oh, and this prayer was written by an Indian Christian man in our congregation. Just try and think who might that be. He's here today. Here we go. Let's pray. <laughs> our dear Heavenly Father, you are the Lord of the universe. Our Saviour Jesus commanded his church in Matthew 28, saying, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations. And he promised to be with us to the very end of the age. Accordingly, you send your ministers and missionaries to all parts of the world, including India. We thank you for sending the Apostle Thomas and others to seek the lost in India. You are the God of compassion and love. You helped Christians to flourish in India. You helped our forefathers and mothers to uphold their faith in India without too many troubles. But during the last few decades, the Hindu nationalists, led by the BJP party and others, started attacking the Christians and their places of worship. They brought laws against conversion and are persecuting your servants. Please help all the Christians in India, especially the pastors and missionaries, to spread your gospel. We know that everything is happening under your mighty control. Even though St. Thomas went to India in 52 AD, the government of India has started falsely claiming that all non-Hindu religions are foreign to India. We pray for the Prime Minister of India, Mr. Narendra Modi, his cabinet and members of his party, to allow non-Hindu religions to practice their faith in peace. Open the hearts of the oppressors to come to the light, to see the one and only living God, who is the creator of the world and everything in it. Thank you that we can celebrate Indian Christian Day. May many from the Indian subcontinent open their hearts to Jesus. Please strengthen your people so they can witness to you in the midst of opposition. We pray all these things in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. going to stand and sing a brand new song. Um, what if I sing through the first verse and then, uh, so you can stay seated for that, and then we'll stand and sing the song together. Okay, yes we do need to have that. Um, it'll be on my desk. And we can do that later in the service. All kinds of things are happening today. It's really good. 
Uh, so I'm just going to sing the uh, first verse of this song uh, so that you get an idea of what it sounds like.
St. Andrew on the 26th of July, 2022. If any person knows any just cause or impediment for which David Clive Bulgens ought not to be admitted to that order, then such a person should declare and signify the cause or impediment immediately to the Archbishop of Sydney. And what that means is uh, Clive has been uh, accepted by the, um, by the diocese as a candidate for ordination. Uh, and that will mean that uh, he will go from being ordained as deacon to ordained as presbyter. Uh, and that means that uh, it gives him a couple of other things uh, that he could do in terms of responsibility. And the biggest one is he could take up a parish as his, of his own as the senior minister if he wishes to. Um, so it's a formal thing that I have to do. I have to, by you know, the, the Anglican law, read that out so that you know that, that it's happening. Uh, and uh, I'm intending to go on the 26th of July uh, to support Clive um, at his ordination. Okay. Well, good thing we didn't forget that. Thank you, David, very much. That's a very important thing. Um, all right. Uh, I knew there was something else I had to do. Just, anyway, I'm going to ask Sarah to come up and uh, pray for us. Um, will you pray with me? Father God, thank you for making us and entrusting us with this world to look after. We thank you for um, the rain and the way that you continue to sustain and grow things for us to live and enjoy. We thank you for the school holidays and the chance to enjoy your creation. But while we are thankful, Lord, we know that the world is groaning for the day when your son will return to put things right. And we bring before you um, a number of things happening around the world the turmoil and difficulties being faced, especially in places like the Ukraine. We ask for peace and a restoration of order. We pray for the Christians there that they will trust you and stay safe. We also pray for the nation of Sri Lanka and for the grim circumstances there at the moment due to corruption. Father, hear the prayers of your people to intervene and to help relieve their suffering. We thank you as we've just sung that, that you have overcome and we know that you will put an end to these things uh, when Jesus returns. Lord, we thank you um, for the blessing it is to meet together today as your people. We thank you for the freedom and the safety we experience here in Australia. May we not take it for granted. We pray that you would continue to help us to make the most of our freedoms that we would be bold in sharing our faith with those around us. We think of the upcoming Holiday Kids Club and the 25 new kids coming along. We pray that there would be nothing in their way on the day to keep them away. We ask for good health and for safety so that they can come along and hear about you. We also ask for the leaders and the supporters involved in running Kids Club. Thank you. Um, we pray that you would help them to prepare well and to speak well about you on the day. We pray for the relationships formed with the kids, that that would be the start of our connection with them and the start of their connection with you. May all the logistics go smoothly so that the focus can be um, on the salvation that we have in Jesus on the day. Lord God, please draw the people of Marylands to yourself. We ask that you would help us to be ready to give an answer for the hope that we have in you. Help us to be faithful and generous with what you've given us to the many people around us with physical needs. And we think of the various ministries at church with ESL, with the mobile pantry. Um, yeah, please draw people to yourself through these things. Lord, we bring before you people that we know and love who don't know you. We pray that we might consider inviting them along to the kids club or to Messy Church next week so that they may be able to hear the good news about Jesus. Father, there are many people that we know at the moment who are sick and suffering. 
We pray for Sandra, Wendy, Lorraine, Andrew, Melita, John, Les, Richard, Jim and Sandra, Florence, Shania, Toby, Barbara, Lubica and Kieran, and Gladys and Jaren. Heal them and comfort them, Lord. We also name before you now silently others that we know who are sick, lonely, struggling, or in need of your help and comfort in some way. Thank you so much for your promise that one day you will put an end to their suffering and wipe away all their tears when Jesus comes back to put things right. We also ask that you'll be with um, the pregnant ladies in our church for Alison and Victoria and their families. Help them to stay healthy and be patient as they wait. We thank you that you made the little babies growing inside them and we ask that you'll keep them healthy also. And as they are born and grow up, we pray that they would have the faith of their parents and follow Jesus for all of their days. Lord, we thank you that you hear us and answer all these prayers because of Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, and we're going to say together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come. May your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today the things we need. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but rescue us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We're going to stand and sing our next song, Calling All Sinners. Yes, you are. One, two, three. Pretending and all of our pride, it's time to come out from where we hide. Calling all sinners to come to this place, this mountain of mercy, this mountain of grace. Fall on His kindness, come without cost. Calling all to come to the cross All our achievements and all that we've gained Whatever status or fortune or fame It all counts for nothing and our only boast Christ crucified, our only hope, calling all sinners to come to this place, this mountain of mercy, this mountain of grace, call on his kindness, come without
seated. Uh, we're now going to have our Bible readings, and I'll just pray as Lyle comes up. Thank you, Father, for making yourself known to us and showing us how to come into your kingdom. We ask that as you speak to us today, that you will help us to listen with eager ears and obey you with joyful hearts. We pray this for your glory and for our good. Amen. Our first reading is from Luke chapter 11, verses 21 to 28. When a strong man, fully armed, guards his own house, his possessions are safe. But when someone stronger attacks and overpowers him, he takes away the armour in which the man trusted and divides up his plunder. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. When an impure spirit comes out of a person, it goes through arid places seeking rest and does not find it. Then it says, I will return to the house I left. When it arrives... It finds the house swept clean and put in order. Then it goes and takes seven other spirits more wicked than itself and they go in and live there. And the final condition of that person is worse than the first. As Jesus was saying these things, a woman in the crowd called out, Blessed is the mother who gave you birth and nursed you. He replied, Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and obey it. And the second reading is from Proverbs chapter 12, verse 26. The righteous choose their friends carefully, but the way of the wicked leads them astray. Thank you, Lyle. When it comes to talking with people about Jesus, there's an old saying. It is more important to win the person than to win the argument. This saying is never truer than when you talk with a person who is caught in a destructive cult. When I was in college, I remember one of the really smart guys, not me, one of the really smart guys in the year, talking about a conversation he had with some Jehovah's Witnesses who knocked on his door. He was so glad. He could show them how smart he was, see? He was so glad that they had come, and he immediately began proving that their understanding of Jesus and the Trinity was wrong. He had outlined a powerful, biblical and logical argument to prove his point. And he was proud of his ability to do that. But he was completely frustrated because the people at his door refused to change their minds, even though they had agreed that his logic and his understanding was probably right. My friend had won the argument, but not the people. That is because my friend, I believe, did not understand how destructive cults work. A few weeks ago, we looked at uh, how destructive cults and their leaders use undue or excessive influence to coerce, manipulate and control people. We looked at the bite model of authoritarian control and, we, uh, and how it can help us recognise the way that destructive cults seek to control people's behaviour, information, thoughts and emotions. They do this by using excessive forms of influence. Now, if you were not here for that talk, or if you want a reminder about how the bite model of authoritarian control works, then I'd encourage you to take another look at my talk from a few weeks back. I've got copies of it in my office, which I can go and get. Uh, or you can read the chapter about destructive cults in the book. Uh, you can check all that out. 
But the basic idea of the bite model is that it demonstrates how destructive cults control a person by excessively influencing their behaviours, information, thoughts and emotions. We saw that by controlling these things, destructive cults control people's relationships, beliefs, finances, and the way cult members live their everyday lives. There was a whole lot of other things we talked about as well. In fact, there is very little a destructive cult will not be able to control through the pressure of undue influence, as seen in the bite model. So how do we go about winning a person for Jesus who is trapped in a destructive cult. It may seem obvious to say this, but we must always begin and end with prayer. Ultimately, we are unable to save anybody. Salvation is the work of God, and we must call upon him to save those who are lost. Now, it is true that we can play a role in helping people to leave a destructive cult, just as we can play a role in helping people find and know Jesus. But the likelihood of one single person being able to draw someone out from the clutches of a destructive cult is rather small. It's more likely that God will use many people, many conversations, many small moments to chip away at the control of a destructive cult. And that is why we need to pray. Because we cannot make it happen. We can only play a part in what might happen as as we ask God to work in a person's life. We also need to be prepared to read the Bible with our loved one, to make sure that they know the gospel well. Jesus truly is the answer to our needs, and the good news of Jesus will save a person from anything for God's glory. However, it is worth noting that if your loved one is in a destructive religious cult, you may need to wait or at least be patient in bringing the Bible to bear, as it is important not to create conflict with your loved one over doctrinal issues, at least not yet. Well, if leaving a destructive cult is extremely difficult, then the best thing to do is to not get caught up in one. Sounds obvious too. Or at least learn how to recognise one before it's too late. As they say, prevention is better than cure. Really knowing Jesus, the Bible, yourself, what your strengths and weaknesses are, your family, and what you long for in life, and how Jesus fulfils every good desire, means that it will be harder for you to be tricked by someone who is trying to deceive you. Not impossible, just harder. Really knowing how destructive cults work and being able to identify them will mean that you you are less likely to be caught up in one. But even with all this background, it doesn't mean that you will never be caught up in a destructive cult. I read an interview only a couple of weeks ago of an Australian destructive cult expert, Sarah Steele. This is her new book. It only has come out in the last couple of days. Uh, she said that even after she'd done a whole lot of study, I think she's got a PhD under, in, in all this, uh, she's done a whole lot of study about undue influence and the way destructive cults work, she ended up being scammed by someone offering a fraudulent financial investment. So as Sarah said... Nobody knowingly joins a cult. That is why I think we all need to be careful, really careful, especially of online scammers, predators, groups, and organisations of different kinds on social media and the internet, apart from anywhere else. If you say that you are a Christian in your profile, like your social media profile, you may receive messages from people that you've never met who also say they are Christians. They then share posts, messages, prayers, and how God has been working in their lives, and they ask you to do that the same in return. After a while, they invite you to their Bible study group, and they begin to recruit you into their destructive cult. This happens a lot more than you realise. It's quite a big thing. 
Then there are other social political groups who seek out young people and encourage them to think of themselves very differently to the way that they used to. My belief is that everyone should have some kind of accountability partner when it comes to the internet and social media. They not only protect you from things that you should not be looking at, they can also prevent you from being scammed or lured into a destructive cult, a fresh set of eyes. Parents, you need to know what is happening for your children and your teenagers online. And adults need to support each other. We are all vulnerable. There should be no secrets when it comes to our online presence. That's why we need to support one another. Well, if someone you know and love gets caught up in a destructive cult, then you need to learn how cults work. We've already talked about the bite model and undue influence, but each destructive cult will have their own methods of applying the bite model and undue influence. So if you want to help a person caught in a particular cult, you have to know what that destructive cult teaches and the methods of control they use in order to work out how to untangle their teachings and to undermine the control they have over the person you love. There are a number of ways you can do this. You can read books, like the one that the lady just wrote. Uh, you can watch documentaries. There are some amazing documentaries to watch. You can check out websites, lots of websites from people, especially this last point. Look for the stories of people who have left destructive cults. You need to hear their stories, their experiences. One of the things you do not want to do is to go directly to the destructive cult or its leaders. Now, you would think, you know, go to the source. That's a good thing to do. But this is dangerous because they do not care about whether you are trying to objectively understand their teachings or not. They don't care about that. Their only concern is whether you will join them or put the organisation into disrepute. And if you put it into disrepute, well, you may need to be aware of the dangers and avoid direct contact with the destructive cults. They may be religious, social, political, they could be a club, all kinds of business types of destructive cults. And don't forget to pray. Continue bringing this issue to God. You also need to understand just how much influence a destructive cult has over a person who is newly recruited into the group. The methods used by destructive cults are all about establishing and maintaining levels of control over each and every member of a destructive cult. Now, I went into a fair bit of detail in the last talk and in my book about, about all this. But you need to know that a major part of their control is based on the loyalty they create in the new member to the destructive cult and its leaders. A cult member's identity becomes so tied up with the destructive cult and its leader that any form of criticism will make you the enemy or a threat to the destructive cult. So if you criticise your loved one for what they are doing, what they are feeling, whatever is happening for them in that moment, you are criticising the cult and its leaders. If you criticise the cult and its leaders, well, you are criticising your loved one. Your loved one is no longer just attending a group. They are the group. And any criticism will make you, uh, will, you make will categorise you as a threat or even an, an enemy to the group. You know, they only really categorise people into three parts. Those who are seeking, like, uh, or, or those who they can talk to, uh, those, who are, um, uh, those who are enemies, uh, and those who are inside the cult. But even those inside the cult can be considered enemies because you've got to watch them. They could always turn. That's why families are destroyed 
by destructive cults. A cult member's identity is no longer tied to their family. It's tied to the destructive cult. So how do you talk with a loved one who is being recruited into a destructive cult? One of the best things you can do is be interested in whatever is happening for them in that moment. If your loved one has just told you, because they might have been doing this for a while and you don't know, if they have just told you that they are thinking about joining an organisation or a group you believe to be a destructive cult, or it seems like they've already been approached by a cult member and are being groomed as a new recruit, it is important that you do not go straight into critique mode or become angry and emotional or start a conflict or an argument with that person. New recruits are often taught, it's a very common thing, that if a family, if family or friends do not accept their new beliefs, their new identity or their new name or whatever it is, then the family or friends are the enemy. They are the devil. They're coming to take away your salvation. Unless there is full acceptance to the point where the family or friends join the organisation or become allies of the organisation, then the new recruit will believe that the family or friends do not really love them. When you argue or fight with your loved one and refuse to accept their new identity or beliefs, then the leaders of the destructive cult are proved right in the mind of the new recruit. Everything the destructive cult leaders said about how the family or friends would react has come true. And this makes the destructive cult even more desirable, more believable, more worthy of your loved one's loyalty, affections and devotion. This is manipulation. This is coercion. This is undue influence. And it is designed to break down all the normal support structures the new recruits used to have. That way, the new recruit will bond with the destructive cult and its leaders. The new recruit will become loyal to the destructive cult. The new recruit will find their meaning, their purpose and security in the destructive cult. And the destructive cult will become the only family or friend the new, destructive, uh, the new recruit needs. So arguing with your loved one will not work. But being interested in what is happening for them in that moment might. That doesn't mean you're condoning. It doesn't mean you're accepting. It means you're interested. With that interest, ask questions. Ask them about what they yearn for, what they hope to gain, what the future will be like if every, everything works out though the, the way they want it to. Ask about their feelings, about the kinds of feelings they had before they met the group, the kinds of feelings they have now. Ask them about what led them to look for such a group, what kinds of questions they wanted answers for, and how you might be able to help them search for the kinds of answers they are looking for. By doing this, you have shown them that you are more interested in them as a person than anything else. It helps your loved one to feel like you love and care about them and it may even prove what the cult leader said about you is wrong. It also gives you great insight into what your family member or friend is really feeling at that moment. And knowing that part of that person, you knowing that part of that person, well, that can do more to winning them back than debating the merits of the group they are wanting to join. Having established that you care about them by being interested in what is happening for them in that moment, you need to show them lots of love. Most destructive cults will love bomb their new recruit. They will do things for them, buy things they want, be in constant contact with them and show them how they love the new recruit more than their family or friends do. 
So it may seem weird, especially within the family, or even with your children or parents or whoever it may be, that you need to woo your loved one. Not romantically, but you need to woo them back. You need to make sure that they know that you love them. Don't take it for granted. Don't think that they would just recognise it. Say the words, I love you regularly. Work out their love language. Is it words of affirmation, quality time, receiving gifts, acts of service to them, or physical touch, you know, a big hug? Then show your loved one the love they yearn for in the love language they understand. If you can work out your loved one's desires and needs, which the destructive cult has tapped into, and you've done that by the questions you've asked, then you could also work at fulfilling those desires and needs. You can't do everything, but you can do something, meaning that your loved one will maybe bond with you rather than the destructive cult. This is a time to make your love really well known. It's got to be explicit, not implicit. Whatever it takes to communicate love to them, do it and do it quickly. And don't forget to pray. Also, depending on the situation, you can talk about how much God loves them, what Jesus has done for them, and how great is his sacrificial love for them. But you've got to work out whether it's the right time to bring the, uh, God's issues into it as well. Destructive cults will also give new recruits new identities. It's quite common. Sometimes new names. And even new or altered memories. They can alter memories. If you want to know more about that, have a look in the, the book. Your loved one may feel differently about you because their memories of, memories of you and how they recall them ha may have been altered. You may have to remind them of who they are by recalling lots of different stories from their past. Now, they may have already shared some of the big stories of their lives to the cult, and so those memories may have already been lost or altered, but keep reminding them of the, the little things about who they are. Memories. Their history. Show them photos. Talk about moments you shared. Talk about relationships they had with others, like their grandparents or their cousins or their siblings, other people, their friends. A big one is pets. <laughs> Talk to them about their pets. And from, you know, things from another time or place. Help them to remember who they once were because that person may still be in there or is still in there. And you might be able to reach them. A very important but difficult thing to do is to somehow create distance between your loved one and the influence of a destructive cult, uh, which ha the, the, the influence the destructive cult has over them. Doing that in your conversations. Now, while I have spoken about being interested in your loved one, showing them lots of love and care and reminding them of who they are and what they mean to you, there will come a time when you will have to challenge them about their new identity, their new beliefs, and possibly even the destructive cult itself. This is tricky, as you do not want to directly criticise the, destru the destructive cult or its leaders, but you still have to challenge your loved one's thinkings. One of the things I do whenever Jehovah's Witnesses come to my door is to try and subtly create some distance between the people at my door from the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society, that's the Jehovah's Witnesses, I want to create distance between them and the, the organisation throughout the conversation. I do this by never identifying them as Jehovah's Witnesses. I call them by name if I can. And I never say, but you believe this. Or you say that, you know, like you might say, 
but you say that Jesus is not the Son of God, or he is the Son of God, but he was created. That just cements their identity as Jehovah's Witnesses. And it also means that you're now in a combat situation. You're battling against them. You know, I don't even talk about what the Jehovah's Witnesses teach. Because as soon as I name the organisation, I don't say Jehovah's Witnesses say this. They will identify with it. And I immediately become their enemy and someone not to be trusted. Rather, I do my best to talk about an unidentified organisation or a group. And I even make hand gestures uh, pointing to this nameless organisation as if they are a third party. I kind of turn my shoulder to them and, and I try to almost, let's stand side by side and look at this nameless organisation. I might talk about the prophecies that a nameless organisation, this group. It's only by doing that kind of thing that I've been able to help a few people at my door think about whether they can trust in an organisation who has made false prophecies. And it has actually happened. I believe one man has walked away from uh, Jehovah's Witnesses after spending three visits with me. Sometimes you can do this by looking at the false prophecies of a completely different destructive cult. You can say, yeah, I've heard about false prophecies from this other one. And you start pointing away from them, uh, like the Mormons. Uh, and ask, about the pe- ask the people at your door whether they, what they would do if they came across similar kinds of false prophecies in their organisation. See how you're helping them to look outside, no longer identifying as one of the group. You can do similar things with your loved one who is becoming a new recruit by looking at what other destructive cults do and talking about them side by side with your loved one rather than having a head-on confrontation about the destructive cult they are joining. I remember watching a program on SBS about scammers and con artists and how they wiggle their way into people's lives. There were lots of different examples of people being tricked into giving over hundreds of thousands of dollars. But what I noticed was that the scammers used a lot of the destructive cult methods that we've talked about. They love bomb a person and become best friends or sometimes lovers. They might even run their scam online so that they never meet the person they are, uh, they are scamming. They make the victim feel special but later they begin to ask for money or gifts. They draw their victim in with loving gestures, gestures, but keep them in with subtle threats. They threaten to leave, they threaten to tell, they threaten to divide the family. And so the victim does whatever it can, takes to keep the relationship going and hands over the money. They use the bite model of control to heavily influence the person they are scamming. Imagine watching a program like that with your loved one who is being recruited into a completely different destructive cult. You could both talk about how easy it is uh, it would be for people to fall uh, to be deceived by scammers. You could talk about the way they used emotional blackmail. You could talk about how they try to break up people's families and the trust they have within their families. You could then ask challenging questions of what your loved one would do if they were caught in such a scam. How they might react if you spoke to them about that scam. You could ask about emotional blackmail and what they would do if someone tried to come between the two of you. You could even ask what if the organisation you are joining was to try to come between the two of us. You see, you need to ask the challenging questions, but you need to do this by coming in from the side, not by challenging them head on. And don't forget to pray. Well, we've talked about winning a person out from under the influence of a destructive cult. But we have to be careful that we do not only do half the job. 
In the Bible reading read out for us today, Jesus talked about an impure spirit coming out of a person so that the person had been saved from the effects of that impure spirit. But because the Holy Spirit had not taken up residence in that person, then the impure spirit returned and took another seven spirits with it. In the same way, our goal should never be to save a person from the undue influence of a destructive cult and just to leave them there. Our goal should always be to lead them to Jesus. You see, salvation is never just from something. It is also to something. We are saved from sin and rebellion to God to serving and honouring God. We are saved from going to hell to being part of God's eternal kingdom. A person is only really saved from a destructive cult when they find their way to eternal salvation in Jesus. So often, people caught in destructive cults are yearning for peace, love, meaning, purpose, and a relationship with something or someone greater than themselves. Jesus offers them this. And a comparison between the sacrificial love of Jesus and the conditional love of a destructive cult and its leaders may help your loved one find their way out. But remember, it is never about winning a debate or proving an organisation wrong. It is about winning the person. We cannot do this on our own. That is why we need to constantly call upon God in prayer to guide us and our loved one into the kingdom of God and to eternal life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Destructive cults are so destructive. They destroy people's lives on earth. They destroy families. Some of us may have even known people who have gone through this or are involved in a cult. It's a desperately sad situation, Lord. And I pray that you might help those people who are in those cults to recognise what is happening to them and to come out from under the influence of such terrible things. But Lord, those people in destructive cults lost in there are no different to anybody else who needs salvation. May you teach us to be able to talk with people. Help them to recognise where they're at. Maybe to be an encouragement and a guide. And to bring them to Jesus. So that their destination would not simply be a bad life now. But that they might be taken out from hell. And brought into your kingdom. We pray for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing God of Calvary.
Uh, from verse 16 it says is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ and is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ because there is one loaf we who are many are one body for we all partake of the one loaf at the heart of the Christian life is active trust in the in the Lord Jesus Christ and his sacrificial death for sin. In this symbolic meal originating from Jesus' last supper with his disciples, we express and strengthen our trust in him as we eat and drink with our brothers and sisters in Christ. The Lord's Supper is a sign of the new covenant which we have in Jesus. It shows us the goodness and grace of God found in the death of Jesus, our Saviour. As we eat and drink together, we are invited to spiritually feed on him with thankful hearts. We are faced again with God's love, even though we are not worthy of it. And we are strengthened by trusting in Jesus, who gave his body and blood, so that we can be saved. We're now going to say these words of a confession. Uh, I'm not sure if they're on the screen or not. Just check. Yes, we do have the prayer of preparation. Let's say these words. We do not dare come to your table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness. Rather, we trust in your boundless goodness and mercy. We are not even worthy to eat the crumbs from under your table. But you are the same, Lord, always rich in mercy. As we eat these symbols of Christ's flesh and blood, Help us to remember that we are cleansed from sin and that we are spiritually living him and he in us. Amen. On the night before he died, Jesus took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After the meal, he took the cup and again giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples saying, drink from this all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Father, we thank you for these gifts of your creation and pray that we who eat and drink them in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, believing our Saviour's word, may eat together these symbols of his body and blood. Amen. We eat this bread and drink the cup. Oh, sorry. As we eat this bread and drink the cup, we proclaim the Lord's death. We do this until he returns. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is put on some gloves and a mask. I will come around uh, with a tray. Uh, If you would like to take part in the Lord's Supper, then hold out your hand and I'll be able to place uh, a cup in there. If you don't hold your hand out, I'll assume that you are not wanting to take part. Then hold on to your, um, hold on to it, uh, the cup, and then we'll eat and drink together when I come back.
So we take the clear plastic and uh, we take that off. Hold the wafer. Take and eat this in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your heart by faith and with thanksgiving. Lift the silver foil. Drink this in remembrance that Christ's blood was shed for you and be thankful. I'm going to pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you that we've been able to eat and drink now, remembering that Jesus died for us. Help us to live as people who trust in Jesus and keep us safe from all the evils of this world. We pray for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to stand and sing our uh, new song. Um, Take heart.
brings us to the end of our formal time together. Uh, just to note to let you know that uh, I'll be away this coming week. Um, and so you can see Clive if you have any things you want to talk about. We've got uh, Holiday Kids Club coming up on Friday. Keep that in your prayers. And then Messy Church uh, w- will be on next Sunday um, in the morning. Okay? Uh, let's say these words of a blessing to each other. May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you his favour and give you peace. Amen. Let's continue our fellowship over some morning tea outside or at least in the hall.